The story I am about to tell is neither a rumor nor word of mouth. Everything happened right in front of my eyes, and all the people involved in this incident are very much alive in flesh and bone. Well, kind of though. Coming from a small town, the first year of my college hit me right on the face like a wake-up call. It took me some time to get used to the speed, but slowly, I started to make good friends. My first friend, Liam, who was also my roommate, belonged to a rich family. His sister, Bethany, too joined the same college next year and became our junior. Bethany had a boyfriend in high school who died in a car accident. After his death, Bethany was never the same anymore. One tragic incident turned her into a completely different person. One day we were chilling in the canteen when Liam started to talk about the spring break. We were a group of five, me, Liam, Bethany, Samantha, and Matthew. Samantha and Liam were something, which they hesitated to admit back then. And I was the forever single kind. But Matthew was in more deep trouble than all of us. He liked Bethany a lot, like a lot. No matter how much he tried to control himself, his heart never let him. Every time Bethany talked to him, we could see his face turn red. Liam was too ignorant to notice how his friend is deeply attracted to his sister, but I did. I couldn't be sure whether Bethany had anything for Matthew because women are hard to read in such cases. And Bethany already had a troubled past that prevented anyone from being personal with her. All of us were discussing our plans for the upcoming spring break when Liam said his father owns a wooden cottage in the valley and we can all have a blast there. Matthew yelled in joy and we all got charged up thinking we will be spending our spring break in the serene mountains. Well, the spring break was memorable, definitely, but in a shocking way. No matter how many spring breaks come and go, none of us will ever forget this one. Liam brought his huge camper van and we all hopped in for a much awaited vacation. On the ride, Matthew sat next to Bethany. After an hour, I saw him making Bethany laugh. It was nice to see them finally get along. The amount of effort Matthew put without making Bethany uncomfortable increased my respect for him. I did not doubt that Matthew genuinely had feelings for her. Around 4 p.m., we reached our destination. The cottage was in such altitudes that we could see the snow-covered mountains from a close distance. Snowflakes were dangling in the air before they slowly touched the ground. Being the only residence in this remote valley, the cottage had every little thing included in it. The living room was huge with an intricately designed fireplace that was enough to warm up the entire valley. Big cushioned chairs were scattered around, providing a comfortable sitting arrangement for a big group of people. After putting our bags in our room, we all sat in the living room, choosing a cozy seat. Liam went to get the most expensive wines from the cellar, while Samantha and I started chatting. Matthew was walking all over the house restlessly and observing each decor like a curious child. Wow, you guys have so many photographs, Matthew said while looking at the wall. I didn't notice earlier, but there were photos framed and hung up on the wall right next to the door. We all got up and walked to take a look at those pictures. There were photos of Bethany and Liam with their parents and high school friends. Among all those photos, there was this one particular frame that caught all of our attention. It was taken inside this house. In that picture, a boy of 16 or 17 years old was sitting in a high back chair near the fireplace and Bethany was standing beside him with a glass of wine in her hand and a big shining smile on her face. Though she looked very excited, the boy had a stern face. He had pale green eyes that instantly caught your attention when you noticed the photo for the first time. Bethany came near us and stood beside Matthew with a calm face. We could all tell who the boy was, so things became quite awkward. Without hesitation, Bethany said in a crystal clear voice, that's Jeremy, my high school boyfriend. This was our last photograph together before he died in that car crash. I'm sorry to hear, Bethany. Yeah, we didn't mean to bring it up, you know? Don't worry, I have already been quite hard on myself. Maybe it's time to move on. Bethany glanced at Matthew while saying the last line, and I could notice a spark of budding love being exchanged between these two young souls. A big smile appeared on Matthew's face as soon as she finally gave him the hint he was craving for so long. Bethany went back to her seat, and Samantha and I start pulling Matthew's leg. I haven't seen a guy blush so much before. A happy mood of vacation kicked in, and Liam entered just at the right moment. He brought some expensive liquor, 
and we started the party. With chilled music playing in the background, everyone was laughing and drinking. In a few words, spring break it took place. All of a sudden, the power went off. The cottage that was filled with loud laughs and clinking of wine glasses drowned into deep silence with its unexpected power cut. The light of the fireplace helped us to locate the living room. Damn, this is unusual. Let's hope the power comes back on soon, Liam said. We all sat down and started to enjoy the spooky ambience around. Heavy wind was blowing outside that made the glass window tremble like timid rabbits. This is a perfect environment for some scary stories, Samantha said. Oh, come on. There are no such things as ghosts, and I'm not in the mood to hear made-up stories that are told to scare children, Matthew replied. Samantha and Matthew got into an argument about whether spirits exist or not, just when I said, well, we can always experiment. Everyone looked at me, and I told them how planchettes are a way to call a spirit. I still regret generating this idea into everyone's mind that night, because what happened next, none of us will ever forget. After a lot of argument and discussion, we all decided to do a planchette just to pass the time. We all thought nothing will happen anyway, so there's no harm in giving it a try. We arranged our chairs in a circle and placed a small wooden table in the middle. Matthew and Bethany sat face to face. Liam and I sat beside Matthew. A candle was lit and placed in the center of the table. I said in a low voice, so whosoever spirit we will summon must be known to all of us. Someone whose face is seen by all of us. Matthew and Bethany looked at each other, and then they looked at the photo of Jeremy. None spoke, but we all got the hint. Liam said in a hesitant voice, Um, Beth, you don't have to do this if you're not comfortable. No, it's fine with me, Bethany replied in an adamant voice. It was as if she wanted to see if spirits exist or not. Place your hands on this table and close your eyes. Concentrate and think about Jeremy. No matter what, don't take your hands off of this table. Jeremy, if you are listening to us, please show some signs. We are calling you, Jeremy. Please show us a sign. The roaring wind and crackling fireplace were the only sound accompanying my voice at that time. Nothing happened for five minutes straight. We were all about to give up when a muffled growl took place. <sighs> Everyone slowly opened their eyes, and we all noticed Matthew. His head was down like he was being hypnotized and growling in a subdued, low voice. Matthew? Are you? A shadowy atmosphere grabbed the living room as the candle went out. The fireplace became the only source of light. I told everyone not to make any movement and asked Matthew in a low voice, Jeremy, is that you? Matthew nodded his head up and down. All of our faces turned pale. He slowly lifted his head, and we saw his eyes were still closed. Bubbles were forming in the corners of his mouth. The suppressed growl notified anger and hatred churning inside him. None of us was prepared for what happened next. Matthew opened his bloodshot eyes and looked at Bethany. His eyes were fixated on her, and deep hatred and anger were burning inside them. Suddenly, he spoke in a demonic voice. Bethy, you want to fall in love again, huh? You want to forget me and move on with Matthew? Oh my God, Jeremy, is that you? Is that you? I won't let you forget me. You are mine, only mine. On that cold night at the top of the mountain, Liam and I pinned him on the ground and started to pour water on his head. I screamed, Jeremy, This is not your world. You need to go away. Leave Matthew and go back. After a long struggle of denial and resistance, Matthew slowly fainted on the ground and his body became calm again. None of us slept that night. Samantha woke up after some time and went straight to her room. Bethany didn't speak a single word that entire night. And as soon as sunrise came, we hopped inside our cars and left the cottage. Matthew was taken to the hospital. For the rest of our college years, everyone got detached as we were too shocked to cope with this truth. Bethany never talked to any of us, and our cheerful college memories ended on a spring break. It's been four years since that incident. The reason why I recalled it again is a wedding card that I received via email. It was from Liam. 
he sent me an invitation to his sister's wedding. On that card, a photograph was placed with Bethany and Matthew standing together. Bethany stood with a big smile, but Matthew's face seemed too serious. As I took a close look, I realized how his eyes had changed color in a weird way. Matthew's brown eyes are now pale green. Not just that, his face reminded me so much of Jeremy. Is this even possible? Does that mean that night Jeremy didn't leave Matthew's body? Instead, he captured it to get back his high school girlfriend. If that's the case, then what happened to the soul of Matthew? Hey guys, I see many of you commenting on my videos that this channel deserves 1 million subscribers. But I also see the percent of people who watch my videos aren't actually subscribed to the channel. So, if you like the content, want to support my channel, and want to see this channel reach 1 million subscribers, or maybe 500,000 subscribers, then go ahead, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. It's free, and you can always change your mind later. My friends and I went to Ireland for our spring break. We managed to score ourselves a spot at a boss beach that was popular with visiting spring breakers from America and Britain alike. We were surrounded by choice girls wearing swimsuits that didn't leave much for us to imagine, and they had a groovy concert playing on stage just for the occasion. A few of the spring breakers were hanging loose on the sands, sunbathing. But me and my pals, Vic and Will, were letting our freak flags fly, dancing to the music like the drunk idiots we were. You gotta give it to the Irish. They know how to make some awesome brew. We must have pounded at least four cans of Guinness by the first hour. I held back and only drank two, though. I was always the most responsible of the three of us, though considering how wild Vic and Will were, that really isn't saying much. Hey, Rick, Will, take a look at those skirts. He pointed at a couple of foxy girls who were hanging to the side away from everyone else. One had red hair like fire, while the others was shiny blonde like gold. Both of them had the most brilliant green eyes I'd ever seen. Moreover, they had the faces of angels and bodies of devils that made us want to send our souls away with pleasure. I wouldn't have minded letting either of them rub some of that Irish luck on me, unlikely as that was to happen. Man, those girls are far out of your league. Vic flashed his best drunken smile and slipped back his golden hair. Just watch and learn, kids. Oh, hell no. We ain't letting you have all the fun. Come on, Rick. I was pretty sure trying to flirt with them was a hopeless endeavor, but I followed them anyway, to keep them out of trouble, if nothing else. Once I got closer, I noticed something off about the girls. Their ears were longer than normal and pointy at the top like a Christmas elf. I'd never seen anything like it before. But then again, I'd also never been to Ireland before. So I assumed that getting your ears done must have been fashionable there or, or something. I doubted Vic or Will even noticed them though, since they were too busy ogling the girls' other assets below the neck. Hey, you girls enjoying the party so far? It's getting a bit dull, to be honest. Yes, I feel the novelties run dry. Huh? So are you planning to stick around or are you going to blow this joint soon? Why does it matter to you boys? Because the best place to party gotta be wherever you girls are at. The girls let out a chuckle at that, and Vic grinned like a smug dumbass at his minor victory. You're right. Parties with us are always more fun. We were actually thinking about getting away from here to join a more exclusive party. It's on another beach near here. You boys want to come along? Oh, hell yeah. But while my friends were patting themselves on the back for getting the girls' attention, I was starting to smell something funky about the whole situation. Still, I was tight with Vic and Will, so I couldn't just leave them there. Plus, I didn't want to be a bummer during our spring break either. The three of us followed the two girls off the beach, away from the screaming crowds at the beach. They led us to a towering cavern that had been a mere five minutes walk away from where we had been partying. There's another beach past this cavern here. If you boys aren't too scared to go inside, we can party it up like no tomorrow on the other side. Alarm bells started going off in my head. I didn't want to go inside a deep, dark cave with a couple of freaky-ass strangers to go God knows where. 
Vic and Will seemed all too eager to follow them, though. Too busy thinking with their head below their belts to see how sketchy this was. And I, not wanting to be the one to bring the mood down, braced myself for whatever was waiting for us on the other side of that dark cavern. I was pleasantly surprised when we all emerged on the other side unharmed onto the most out-of-sight beach I'd ever seen in my life. It was almost as if we weren't even on Earth anymore. The sands were the purest white I'd ever seen. The waters were a crystal clear shade of azure blue I'd only seen on stained glass windows. And even the sky itself somehow looked brighter and clearer than before with not even a cloud in sight. But best of all, there was a party going on in full swing with the hottest babes in the galaxy. Several of them came over to greet the girls we'd entered with, and I noticed they all had pointy ears too. I was about to finally ask them what the hell was up with their ears when one of them handed me a cup of booze. I took a single sip of the golden liquid, and it was like all thoughts and reservations melted away from my mind. I don't remember much about what happened after that. All I know is that it involved a lot of dancing and even more drinking. I actually lost track of Vic and Will at some point, but I didn't care. I was way too busy having a good time with the ladies at the party and dancing to the otherworldly music around us, played by a band I couldn't see. Time flew by in a flash, though the skies above didn't get any dimmer. Without my friends around, I started flirting with everything in a bikini to little success. None of them outright rejected me, but they seemed to regard me with the same sort of mild amusement you give to a funny stray dog begging for treats. After a while of being able to make girls laugh but not swoon, I decided to pull out the big guns. I had a guitar in the back of the rented van my friends and I came to the beach on. It was a stupid idea fueled by alcohol-induced idiocy, but I thought I'd be able to woo them with the power of groovy music played from my banged-up guitar. I set my latest cup of golden booze on a flat rock near the cavern entrance and left the party the same way I got in. I walked through the cavern while using the walls to feel my way through the darkness. The moment I came out on the other side, I felt the strength leave my body. My breathing became short and tired, while my back and knees started to ache like I'd just run a marathon. Suddenly, the thought of getting the guitar to woo the girls became the last thought on my mind. Whatever the golden booze that they served us was, it was causing me one hell of a hangover that I needed to sleep off at the van. I made my way to the main beach where people were still having their spring break party. The music wasn't nearly as groovy as before though. In fact, it was loud, obnoxious music from a genre I'd never heard before in my life and did little to help my throbbing hungover head. I brushed it off as a European thing and made my way to the parking lot as quickly as possible. When I got there, our van was nowhere to be found. Instead, the parking lot was filled with weird-looking cars I knew weren't there when I first arrived. Out of curiosity, I approached one to check it out. I saw my own reflection on its shiny waxed surface and let out a hoarse gasp. The person that looked back at me from the car's reflection was an old, ragged man in his 70s instead of the clean-cut 20-year-old I'd been when I arrived at the beach. As I was struggling to process my new look, Someone at the beach party announced something through a speaker and filled me with the horrifying realization of what had happened. Let's go! Spring Break 2018! Woo! They said the year was 2018. But when I arrived, it was only 1965. Somehow, while I was busy dancing and drinking with those pointy-eared folk, over 50 years had gone by in the outside world. I immediately rushed back to the hidden beach as quickly as my aging knees could take me. I never paid much attention in English class, but I did remember the story of Rip Van Winkle. Sleeping decades away after drinking with the magical men in the mountains, though in my case, I was partying rather than sleeping. I stumbled through the darkness of the cavern entrance and came out the other side. There I saw a regular beach instead of the pristine paradise I'd been drinking in only moments ago. The only things out of the ordinary were the corpses of two wrinkled old men. And although age had ravaged them, I still recognized them as the Vic and Will by the swim trunks they wore. Their dying faces were fixed into a blissful smile. 
unaware of the time that had passed during a spring break party that never ended. When I was a little boy, my father told me something while we were sitting in the forest. He said, Listen now, my dear Andrew. There's nothing more beautiful in this world than the nature that surrounds us. I want you to look around and see the beautiful living trees that loom above us, the soft grass that we walk on, the feeling of comfort you feel when you're here, and I want you to appreciate all of it. Nature gives us a lot of things, my son, and there's no better way to say thank you than preserving it. I have carried these words all my life, as in that moment, I truly felt as if the trees and everything surrounding me were speaking to me. The love for the forest only grew from there, and it hasn't wavered till today. And I was a 23-year-old environmentalist college student who played football. My father was Ludwig Charles, a millionaire who also had a strong passion for the preserving of nature. Unfortunately, he died when I was 18 due to health issues. While the death of my father was painful, I took solace in continuing his passion as I stood up for the preserving of nature at any chance I could. While I was in college, I began to balance playing football with studying and my environmental activist work. College was great and my first three years were amazing. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to finish college as a little incident happened during the spring break of my third year. I had invited one of my teammates and my very close friends, Samuel Brown, to one of my dad's mansions to spend the break. I had known Samuel since childhood and he was like a brother to me, so I knew he'd be the perfect person to spend the break with. We reached the mansion, which was situated really close to the forest, and Samuel made a comment saying, Wow, dude, the forest is really growing out. He was right, as the trees had started encroaching on the back of the mansion. I knew my father built the mansion here so he'd be close to the forest, and I knew that he'd be happy even if the forest was growing out. So I replied to Samuel with, as it should be. Samuel then made a joke saying, With the way you love nature, I know you'd be ecstatic if the forest completely covered the mansion. That way, you can literally say that you live in the forest because you're a hardcore environmental lover. We both laughed as we walked inside. After settling down, we began to watch some TV, and that night on the local news channel, it was revealed that for the past two years, numerous lumberjacks had been going missing. And with no one to cut down the trees, the forest had been growing out at a rapid pace. I could tell Samuel was baffled by the information, and I didn't want to talk about it because I knew it had changed the evening's mood. So I decided to change the topic by asking if he wanted to play video games. We played for a while before Samuel said he wanted to ease himself. I asked him if he knew where the toilet was, as I didn't want him getting lost in the big house as he said. <laughs> Don't worry, man. I'll find it myself. About five minutes passed before I heard Samuel's gut-wrenching scream fill the house. I immediately ran over to where the scream came from so that I could make sure he was all right. I reached the scene to see my friend Samuel standing in the kitchen freezer and staring at the numerous frozen dead bodies strung up to the ceiling like meat. A shocked Samuel then asked me, What the hell is this, man? And I calmly replied to him with, Oh, sorry you had to see that. These are actually all the bodies of those fucking lumberjacks who have been going missing for the past two years. I killed them all because they were murderers. My friend Samuel then looked at me in disbelief and said, What? How? This, this, is, this is just a sick prank, isn't it? I then looked him dead in the eye and said, No, it's actually not. And believe me, it wasn't easy, but that's why I play football and go to the gym a lot. I knew after killing these bastards, I'd have to drag them all the way here, and I needed a lot of strength for that. Oh well, I was just doing the necessary. Samuel then stuttered. Why would you do that, man? What did they do to you? I then replied to him with, Because they cut down the living trees that grow in the forest. It's funny how if a human being is cut down, the killer is tried for murder. But if a tree that grows and lives is cut down, Nothing happens to the ones responsible. Isn't that a perfect example of double standards? With a baffled look, Samuel then told me, Look, Andrew, I know you and your father loved nature, but you killed numerous men, and that isn't okay. 
I was getting a bit agitated now, as he wasn't understanding what I was trying to tell him. So I replied to him with, It also isn't okay to cut down trees. They are living things too, and if you listen closely, you can hear them speak. People are out there committing atrocities by forcefully taking from nature and with no repercussions. My father tried to stop it by raising money and giving environmental sermons, but that doesn't really change anything, Sam. People are still out there destroying nature however they please, and in the end, he couldn't do anything to stop it. So I decided to do it my way, to preserve nature at any cost. After I finished speaking, I saw the look of fear and terror in Samuel's eyes as he was looking at me like I was crazy. I knew he now saw me as a deranged serial killer. And if he escaped, he would call the cops. So with no hesitation, I attacked him. We struggled for a while, but I overpowered him easily. As even though we were both football players, I had a better build. So that gave me the upper hand. I pinned him down quickly and I began to strangle him. I could see him struggle for air as I choked him harder. The man I was strangling was like my own brother. I knew letting him go would be the end of me, but I just couldn't bring myself to kill him as Samuel always supported me through all my environmental issues and endeavors. So in that moment of clarity, I let him go. He ran out of the freezer and I just sat there as I heard him call 911 and in under 15 minutes, I was surrounded by cops. My father's lawyer took my case, but I didn't deny what I did as I was proud of him. The families of the lumberjacks wanted me dead, but my lawyer pleaded insanity, so they deemed me mentally unstable and I was sent to a psychiatric ward for treatment. As I sit in this madhouse, I'm writing this incident to enlighten the world about my story. The so-called environmentalists who are meant to be saving the trees just sit there like fools typing and tweeting, save the trees without actually doing anything about it. And that gets me so angry as you're all watching the environment you supposedly love die. As this is a touchy subject, I could go on and on about this, but I'll end this all by saying I am not mad, neither am I mentally unstable. The trees do live, and I did what I had to do to preserve them. I stand by what I did, and if given the opportunity, I would do it again.